My name is Michael Wallace. I'm a professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida, and one of the gastroenterologists here in our practice. Uh, one of the things that has really changed remarkably in the practice of gastroenterology over the last five to ten years is how we can use endoscopes to look inside people's bodies to make diagnoses, to make predictions, and increasingly to treat diseases that affect the gastrointestinal tract. Endoscopes are flexible fiber optic instruments where we can look inside a patient's stomach or their colon while they're sedated and under anesthesia. And we typically use these to detect diseases in patients who have symptoms. In the upper gastrointestinal tract, we often look in people's stomach when they have heartburn or ulcer-like symptoms. And in patients who require screening, which is really uh, all Americans over the age of 50 or anybody else at risk for colon cancer, uh, we perform colonoscopy to prevent colon cancer. I want to start a little bit with some of the changes that we've seen in endoscopes over the last five years and then talk about how those have impacted how we use them uh, for these medical indications. Like many people have seen in the video world on their televisions, watching sports events, Endoscopes have also undergone a change towards high-definition cameras. We've all seen how our televisions have gone to large, flat-screen, high-definition images. And we can all appreciate how those images are uh, much easier to look at, much sharper, and allow you to see things with much higher resolution. The same changes have also uh, taken place in the world of medical imaging. We now have high-definition cameras on the front end of these special endoscopes and high-definition monitors in the endoscopic rooms at our clinic, as well as many other clinics throughout the United States and throughout the world. And what this allows us to do is look at the inside of people's bodies with much greater precision, and particularly to detect some very subtle changes that often indicate very early disease processes, and sometimes to distinguish between what is a, a benign variant versus a truly significant disease. Let me give you an example. Somebody who's had heartburn for many, many years, we would typically recommend that they undergo an upper endoscopy to look at their esophagus. When we do that, we're looking for a particular change called Barrett's esophagus. This is a change that happens in the lining of the esophagus that increases someone's risk of developing esophageal cancer. The problem is that although that person has an elevated risk, their absolute risk is still relatively small. The background risk in the population is extremely small, and it increases somewhat in these patients, but it's still relatively small. So most patients, even with Barrett's esophagus, won't go on to develop esophageal cancer. The only way that we have right now to determine which of those patients are likely to get cancer is to do biopsies. And we have to do a lot of biopsies. In fact, we typically biopsy about four times every inch along the esophagus just to get enough of a sample to determine if there are precancerous changes. Again, most of those biopsies turn out to be benign, but we have to do a lot of biopsies to be confident that there are no precancerous changes. That's where these high definition cameras have really come into uh, a very helpful uh, applications. Right now we can look with a high definition camera and we can often see these precancerous changes that we couldn't previously see with our standard resolution endoscopes. That allows us to target the biopsies to these areas and usually detect the precancerous change before it becomes an invasive cancer and has the chance to spread. In addition to the high definition cameras, we now have several other instruments that have really just been developed in the last year or two that even further enhance our ability to detect these precancerous changes. One of these is a technique called narrow band imaging, and there are similar technologies uh, used in other systems that allow us to see with even greater detail where these precancerous changes are occurring. The narrow band imaging takes advantage of the fact that early cancers and certainly later cancers require an increased blood supply because they're metabolically active, they require more nutrients and oxygen to divide, and we take advantage of that by using the special narrowband imaging, which looks very carefully at, at where there are increased blood vessels. And wherever there's increased blood vessels, we typically find precancerous or cancerous changes. We just recently completed a major study here at the Mayo Clinic in Florida that was led by my colleague, Dr. Herbert Wolfson, where we tested these new narrowband imaging endoscopes compared to our standard 
uh, endoscopes that were available before that. And we showed that we could significantly increase our ability to detect cancer and importantly do it with fewer biopsies and also detect higher grades of cancer than with the standard endoscope. So it was a triple win. Earlier detection, fewer biopsies, uh, higher grades of changes detected. So it was overall a much more effective process for detecting early cancer in Barrett's. The latest innovation, and one which we'll be presenting at our major national meeting in gastroenterology called Digestive Disease Week uh, early in May in New Orleans, is a technology called confocal endomicroscopy. Now, uh, typically, we imagine, uh, you can imagine when we do a biopsy, we remove that tissue and we look at it under a microscope. And a pathologist typically does that after they stain the tissue overnight. And we typically get an answer a day or two later as to whether there are precancerous changes. And if there are, we often have to go in and treat that. Many times we can do that through the endoscope, but it has to be done at a separate time because we have to wait for that pathology result. We also have to remove that tissue. And although we've come to accept biopsies as a standard method, it still is, uh, would be desirable not to have to remove that tissue. That's where these confocal microscopes have come into play. These are tiny, tiny microscopes. It's only about two millimeters or about an eighth of an inch in diameter. So we can actually now put the microscope inside the esophagus through the endoscope and look at the tissue, look at the cells, even individual blood cells we can see with these confocal microscopes. Again, we just recently completed a very large study. This was done at multiple centers around the world, including here at Mayo Clinic in Florida. We were actually the largest enrolling center in this study. And what we compared was using this confocal microscope to the standard endoscopic image. We actually compared a standard endoscope, a narrowband imaging endoscope, and then an endoscope with this guidance through the confocal microscope. And again, we showed even further improvement in our ability to detect and characterize these precancerous changes. So much so that if we used all three methods, a high definition endoscope, a narrowband imaging scope, and a confocal microscope, we in fact were able to detect all patients who had precancerous change, even without a biopsy. Now obviously we confirmed biopsy as part of this study, but it allows us now to conclude that we can detect precancerous changes in virtually every patient, even without a biopsy. So that's going to change how we practice the field of upper endoscopy. Instead of taking random biopsies, again, four biopsies every inch, we can now do targeted biopsies just of those areas that clearly are suspicious for disease. Even furthermore, we can do immediate treatment because the images are available during the procedure. We can interpret them in real time. And if there is an abnormality, we can go directly to treatment. Let me turn now to the lower GI tract. We talked before about performing colonoscopy. This is something that many Americans have undergone. It's currently recommended that everyone age, over the age of 50 have a procedure to prevent colon cancer. And colonoscopy is the most common procedure performed in the United States for this purpose. When we do a colonoscopy, we typically see a few small polyps in the colon in many people. In fact, about half of individuals will have at least one small polyp in their colon. Unfortunately, many of those polyps uh, are completely benign, but the only way to know that is to remove them and have a pathologist, again, examine that polyp under a microscope. Now, it's certainly good to have a benign polyp, but it's not good to have to remove it to determine that it's benign. What we really want to do is focus our attention on those polyps that are precancerous and remove those and confirm those and not have to remove all of the other benign polyps. So we have taken a similar approach in the lower GI tract as we did in the upper GI tract, using high definition cameras, narrow band imaging endoscopes, and this confocal microscope to tell us which of these polyps are precancerous and which of those are benign. And we've seen similar results to what we saw in the GI tract. We again will be presenting a study uh, at this meeting, Digestive Disease Week, next month in New Orleans that showed that among the small polyps, those that are more likely to be benign, we could very accurately predict those polyps that were benign and those polyps that were precancerous, and thus guide the treatment to the polyps that were precancerous and leave those polyps that were completely benign alone and not have to remove them, or at least remove them uh, and, and not have to get pathologic confirmation when we can make a very confident diagnosis that it is benign. 
The other area that this has clearly helped in the lower GI tract is just detection of polyps. What we've seen over the last couple of years, and we've just recently published a fairly large paper on this from our practice here at the Mayo Clinic in Florida, is that these high definition colonoscopes are able to detect more polyps and more patients with polyps than our old standard. This is an important issue because even though colonoscopy is effective at preventing colon cancer, it doesn't prevent every colon cancer. In fact, the best estimates suggest it protects about 90% or it prevents about 90% of colon cancer. So there still are some cancers that are missed. And we think that those arise from these subtle, small polyps that are difficult to see with a standard endoscope. What we've now shown is that when we use a high definition endoscope, we can detect many more of these subtle, small polyps and then remove those, hopefully leading to more effective colon cancer prevention. The last area I want to talk about is a new technique that is related actually to lung cancer. And although we practice this from a, the perspective of a gastroenterologist, one of the diseases where our endoscopes has important applications is in lung cancer. And the reason for that is the chest and the lungs in general are very difficult to access surgically. As you all well know, uh, the lungs are surrounded by the rib cage, the heart, and very important blood vessels. And so a surgical approach to lung tumors is quite challenging technically. What we've recently been able to uh, develop and investigate further is a special type of an ultrasound endoscope that can be placed in the esophagus through the mouth. And from the central part of the chest, we can look at lung tumors and particularly at the lymph nodes where those lung tumors might spread and sample those with a very tiny needle to determine if the cancer has spread. The reason that's important is the way we treat lung cancer depends on whether it has spread or not. If it's not spread to the lymph nodes, we generally recommend surgery. Whereas if it has spread to the lymph nodes, we usually use a combined approach with chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery after the lymph nodes have been cleared. What we've recently been able to show is that using a standard ultrasound endoscope combined with this very fine needle biopsy, we can then look at that tissue not only with the traditional pathologic methods, but we can look at the genes that are associated with cancer and look at those genes within the individual lymph node and predict if that lymph node has microscopic cancer deposits in them, what we call micrometastases. These are the types of metastases or tumor cells that are too small to see even through a regular microscope. By looking at the cancer genes in the lymph node, We've now been able to find additionally about 20% more lymph nodes that have cancer cells in them. And what we'll be presenting in the most recent study is, a, is an analysis seeing if the patients who have these microscopic cells or microscopic cancer cells are more likely to suffer long term from their disease. And in fact, uh, what we predicted was true. If there are microscopic cancer cells in the lymph nodes, those patients have a much worse prognosis. And those are the patients we want to target for additional treatment. Whereas those that don't have the microscopic cancer deposits have a very good chance of long-term survival and probably don't need any other treatments such as chemotherapy and radiation. So those are several studies that we'll, we'll be presenting at Digestive Disease Week. We actually have more than 30 studies that we'll be presenting from our group here at Mayo Clinic in Florida. So it's been a very productive year for our group in terms of scientific advancements. And we're looking forward to feedback from our colleagues uh, going ahead with publishing these papers in, their, uh, in full scientific manuscripts and hopefully getting this information out there to the general community where it can be applied and hopefully benefit our patients. Thank you.